Konbanwa, minasan. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? We're live, I think. Hello, hello. So today I'm joined by three tutors. You can already see them. Minasan, konbanwa. Kyo wa, ano, watashi fukumete yonin koushi sanin de sankashimasu. Um, if the sound is okay and everything, um, feel free to comment in the chat. If you're having any issues with the sound or the video, you can also comment and maybe restart. Um, um, okay, so there uh, are Dai Sanju Sankai Ego Symposium Pride Month 2024 を開始したいと思います。えー、実は2022年にスタートした、えー、今回は第3回目となる、えー、と LGBTQIA+ プラスをテーマにしたシンポジウムになります。えー、本日司会を担当しますカフェトークスタッフのマレンと申します。My name is Madeline, and I will be your host today for this 33rd English Symposium uh, for Pride Month uh, 2024. Um, the third time uh, we are doing this symposium uh, with LGBTQIA plus topics um, since starting in 2022. And um, today we're joined by three tutors who will be talking about the following topics. Uh, first off, we have uh, Fran. They will be talking about the asexual community in Italy. Fran And then next up, we have um, MJ or Mindy, um, who will tell us about the history of LGBTQIA plus rights in San Francisco, USA. And then finally, we have Sinead, um, who will tell us about same-sex marriage in Ireland, uh, the road to equality is what uh, it's titled. Um, so, Okay, I'm already excited, but I have a few more things I want to mention about the live stream. Um, so just a few more seconds. So um, participants who post comments during the live stream will have a chance to uh, win a free lesson ticket for a lesson with one of today's tutors. So don't miss the chance and send us your comments. え、そしてライブ配信中コメントを書き込んでくださった方の中から抽選で今回紹介する、え、3人の講師の中から1人を選んで、えっと、レッスンに使える無料チケットが当たれますので、え、ぜひコメントを投稿してください。え、もし講師
from Italy. My pronouns are they, them. And uh, today we'll be talking about the asexual community in Italy. Um, in this presentation that I've prepared for, for you, we will see what asexuality is, and we will learn some important keywords, both in English and in Italian. And uh, after that, I will give a little bit of context about the Italian queer community. And uh, so I can introduce some Italian activists and the way they are helping um, the situation and the community in Italy. So let's go. <laughs> uh, I need to. Okay. <laughs> Asexuality is a sexual orientation where the person does not experience any sexual attraction towards any gender. Uh, asexuality is also used as an umbrella term, a word that it's used to cover a broad number of items that have a common category. And in this case, it's for all the identities that fall under the uh, asexuality spectrum. We also use the word spectrum because just like colors, sexuality can vary in form and intensity for each and every one of us, uh, yet everything one can experience is both valid and welcome. On this very colorful slide, um, you can see a lot of illustrations and these are not just pretty, they are also some of the cultural symbols for the asexuality community. We have uh, garlic bread, and cake, which are used uh, in the meme culture. And they're, they refer from a very old joke <laughs> at the beginning where, where the internet community was starting, um, that it means that asexual people would rather eat cake or garlic bread rather than engage in sexual activities. Then we have the playing cards. Uh, this is also one of the earliest symbols, um, and uh, it gives the asexual community the nickname Ace, just like the Aces in the in the playing cards. And each suit or each symbol has a different meaning. And if anyone is interested in the specific meanings for each card, uh, we can come back to these uh, during the Q and A. We have the arrows, which give the nickname Arrow to the aromantic community in the asexual spectrum. And then we have some rings. And the rings have a very deep and personal meanings for asexual people. And uh, some might decide to wear them to show in a subtle way um, their identity, to show pride in their identity. We have two types of rings. The aromantic ring, which refers to a white ring that it's worn on the middle finger of the left hand. Uh, or the asexual ring, which is a black ring that it's worn on the middle finger of the right hand. Uh, in Italy, we have an additional symbol. Um, as I said earlier, we in English, we say spectrum to refer to the asexual community. But in Italian, this word can be uh, translated as spettro. And this has a double meaning. It also means spectrum or ghost. So in the Italian pride parades, you can sometimes see asexual people wearing t-shirts with ghosts or creepy things uh, as, a, as a symbol um, and using this pun um, to, to have a laugh. <laughs> and now that we've talked about asexuality, it is very important to understand uh, the uh, split attraction model. And uh, this is a um, psychology theory, uh, and the earliest version of this model was created in 1879. Um, whenever we are questioning our sexuality or our gender, um, it can be a very difficult process. And this model is really helpful for, it has been really helpful for the ACE community towards the, uh, during the years. It works like this. We have sexual attraction, which involves an intense desire for intimate sexual contact with others of the same or different genders. We have physical attraction that involves the desire for physical contact, for example, holding hands, sitting next to each other. We have romantic attraction, which is a combination of passion and emotional attachment. Um, for example, when you are romantically attracted to someone, you can also say that you have a crush on this person. Then we have emotional attraction. 
uh, involves the desire for closeness and connection, but not specifically with any physical contact. Uh, we also have a, a word to define um, an emotional relationship, which is a squish. It's it's basically when you want a strong emotional but a not romantic relationship with someone. So we can say that it's the asexual version of a crush. And then last but not least, we have aesthetic attraction, uh, which is the feeling of admiration for someone's appearance. For example, the way they dress, the color of their hair, and so on. All of these different type of attractions may or may not mix and overlap in a relationship. Um, for example, you might like someone's fashion sense and also wanting to, ki to kiss them, or you might want to hang out with a person but not wanting to hold hands. Right? It's a little bit different for uh, everyone. And I truly believe that this model is not only helpful for Aero Ace people, but it can be useful for everyone to better understand our feelings, set boundaries, and make informed decisions when it comes to relationships. Right after, I would like to talk a little bit more in depth about the asexual community. Uh, we said earlier that asexuality is an umbrella term, so there are different identities under this word. And uh, after talking about the split attraction model, or SAM, uh, we can better understand two identities which are often um, confused uh, and they're not very known even in the queer community. Uh, gray sexuality, or gray A, is a sexual identity where someone can experience sexual attraction rarely or during some specific situation, or it's very confusing in general. While demisexuality is uh, a person might feel sexually attracted to someone only after they have developed a very bond with the personal bond with someone uh, doesn't mean that this person will automatically become sexually attracted to the other, but uh, having this strong bond is necessary for their feelings to, to grow. Another very important identity in the spectrum is aromanticism, aromantic people. Um, we said earlier that the nickname is Aero, and uh, this describes people who do not experience any kind of a romantic attraction. Um, aromantic people can experience different type of attractions uh, or want different types of relationships, depending on their needs. Um, there is not one way to experience being asexual or being aromantic. This might feel like a repetition, <laughs> but it's not. Um, this is the Aero Ace flag, uh, which represents people who are both asexual and aromantic. Um, this is called the Sunset flag and create um, in mind people who don't do not split any kind of attraction in their mind and this is why uh, this flag does not have the color purple which is the main color for the asexual flag nor the color green which is the main color for the aromantic flag now that we've got a better idea of what asexuality is, um, how does the Italian community look like? Just like every other country, we have pride parades. Um, the peculiarity of Italy is that almost every region has its own uh, pride parade. Uh, why is that? Well, we are a fairly new country. We've been united just for 150 years, if it, even if it might uh, seemed like a long time um, because of the earlier separation uh, needs and realities and culture change depending uh, on where you are 
in Italy. And I'm from Tuscany, Toscana. And uh, there are local community, local queer, queer communities in almost every big city, like Firenze or Pisa. You might have heard uh, Livorno. And uh, every year, the Tuscany's regional council calls a meeting to decide the theme for the parade and where it will be held. For this year, uh, the parade for Tuscany will be held in the beautiful city of Lucca. And uh, other pride parades that are very popular uh, always are held in Milano or Bologna and uh, Rome. Rome is definitely one of the biggest pride parades that um, Italy has. Um, having this many parades is not necessarily a bad thing. I have to everyone forth their, uh, their ideas and so everyone can feel welcome and heard. On an even more serious note, I would like to talk about how the situation in Italy is. Um, you can see here a map from uh, Rainbow Maps. And um, uh, lately, the situation for the LGBTQEA plus community in Italy hasn't been the uh, It can definitely be and so map and the um, official census on equal rights around Europe. And uh, the points are uh, made with a score of over uh, 70. Um Um, I did a little see for Italy on this slide, and the the rights that we have at the moment are anti-discrimination law in the workplace. However, it unfortunately excludes asexual and aromantic people because the law only talks about sexual attraction. Um, we the queer people are allowed to donate blood. Uh, partnership registration and cohabitation is allowed. Um, I've heard from a lot of uh, friends, other European friends, that they thought Italy had uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, however, we do not. We only have uh, a partnership recognition. Um, a trans or non-binary person is allowed to change their name. Uh, there's no compulsory medical procedures, for example, of mandatory sterilization uh, in order to uh, go through uh, gender affirming care. And there are no laws banning uh, public meetings, associations, or limiting any kind of freedom of expression. This is a very short list <laughs> if we compare it to uh, other countries. So there is a lot of work uh, to be done. Uh, one of the reasons why there is so little knowledge about um, LGBTQ issues, it, it's also because there's very little resources being put towards information. There's no coverage on national te television, for example, about queer issues. And the only times when the community is uh, talked about is when there is a scandal. Uh, for example, when some um, celebrity uh, comes out as gay, like it happened for a very famous Italian singer, Tiziano Ferro, in 2010, or a little bit more problematic scandals uh, with politicians, or very recently, unfortunately, with uh, the Pope. Um, but this situation is not a lost cause, and that's why the work of Italian activists and associations is so, so important. So let me introduce you to Arono Celeprin. Arono also uses pronouns they, them, and they are an asexual, non-binary, and autistic Italian filmmaker and activist. 
A lot of their work involves challenging social misconceptions, promoting intersectional inclusivity through their art. They are mainly active in the Milano area, but they do take time to participate in uh, pride parades around, uh, around Italy. Um, one of their uh, focus is their social media account uh, lately. And uh, they were the first person in Italy to challenge the most common definition of asexuality, which stated that asexuality is the lack of sexual attraction to others or a low or absent interest or desire for sexual activity. Um, this definition might sound okay, but it does have a negative impact for the community because it implies that asexual people are missing something. Um, often asexual people are referred to as their late, bl late bloomers or prudes, or simply they did not find the right person yet. Um, let me give you another example. Um, we would never say to a gay man, I'm sure you'll find the right woman one day, right? So why are we using this kind of speech towards asexual people? Uh, and Arono has been doing a great job in bringing this issue uh, up front and teaching Italian people uh, about asexuality. Uh, one of their most important work is a documentary representing the Italian asexual community in a very truthful and relatable way. They interviewed 25 people across different regions, and this um, documentary won an award at the Monza Film Festival in 2023 for the best LGBTQ uh, plus section. Another great example of their work is uh, they're bringing for the necessity to update Italian as a language itself uh, to include ne neutral conjugation. Um, Italian is a Roman language, so it has a grammatical gender, uh, which divides words in masculine and feminine. For example, uh, the word doctor can be translated as dottore or dottoressa. A neutral example uh, that people have been using so far is dottoru, or removing the last vowel entirely, dottor. In written form, the people uh, also have been using the schwa, which is a new letter for Italian people, and it looks like an upside down E. <laughs> Very important uh, figure in the Italian asexual community is Caro Di Boi. Caro Di Boi is the first and so far the only <laughs> asexual uh, association in Italy. It was born in Florence in 2016 as a blog and it became an official association in uh, 2018. Uh, the origin of their name is very important, in my opinion. They decided to name themselves after a slur, uh, which was used to invalidate asexual people, and it also had uh, other problematic meanings. We've seen that with the word queer and the word gay, for example. Uh, these words have been reclaimed, and this gives asexual people strength against those who bullies them with a little sprinkle of irony. Caro di Boi were the ones who created a census for Italian people because the national uh, Italian census excluded asexual and aromantic people. Uh, they are the first asexual group to be included in the Pride Regional, uh, Regional Council, both in Tuscany and Lombardy. And despite being a very small association, they only have five <laughs> board members, they really do their best to share knowledge and information about asexuality. Um, they organize a lot of seminars, uh, meetups, and they're actively participating in uh, every year's International Asexuality Day, 
which is an uh, online event with a 24 hour long live stream um, featuring uh, asexual uh, activists and artists and writers from all around the world. And there's panels in a lot of different languages as well. Um, they work mainly through their blog and through in-person events. And their work is aimed both towards asexual people and people who are trying to understand what asexuality is. They do a lot of translation work too, <laughs> because lots of information is mainly in English. So in conclusion, um, while the situation in Italy might be challenging for some parts uh, with active work and involvement, uh, I'm sure that we will see a positive change soon. I think that in every context, by coming together and uh, taking proactive steps, for example, spreading awareness, uh, learning the right vocabulary, uh, being respect respectful and learning pronouns, um, so we can des describe one another, we can also overcome any obstacle that we can face. And uh, well, that's it from my side. <laughs> Thank you for listening and again, happy Pride. Thank you very much. That was so insightful. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we can see it in the acronym already. It's LGBTQIA+, right? So it's it's the A is at the end. It's sometimes forgotten if people That's stop right. after the fourth <laughs> letter. So yeah, it was really interesting to learn something about the maybe lesser known part. Um, so let me first check which comments we've got. So one student says um, the ghost reference is so cute. So I think that's about when you said that the like a word in Italian sounds similar to ghost of spectrum, yes. I think, right? Yeah. Spe yes. <laughs> Nice. Uh, yes, yeah, what other students said, uh, the split attraction model is interesting. Yeah, I thought so as well. That's um, something you don't, I don't, you don't hear in pop culture when it's talked about like romance and falling in love or whatever. It's not these different categories. So that's really interesting to think about. It's very um, helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe even uh, ourselves, we have experienced maybe feeling some kind of attraction towards a person, but not all of them that are listed there. So then you think, oh, okay, maybe that's helpful. Exactly. It's, it's very common, for example, um, people to have a one night stand, but they this doesn't mean that they specifically want to have a relationship mm. with this person, right? So that is simple sexual attraction with nothing else involved. Right, right. So just as sexual attraction exists on its own, all of these other attraction can exist or coexist depending on the yeah. person on the situation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting to have the words to talk about it. So then you realize something that you didn't when you didn't have the words, which I feel like is so much exactly. in, in all of this, uh, these queer topics. Um, another student says how beautiful the arrow ace flag is. I, I agree that the sunset it was, right? That was so pretty. Yes. There's a lot of artists, uh, many, many artists who uh, take it as a reference for their il illustration or to make subtle accessories um, because it can be scary to go out on full pride attire uh, in some countries. So I think that the Aero Ace flag is one of the uh, most disguisable in general. You can uh, fit it in basically any illustration and it will work. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and I, I, it's so interesting how beautiful all these flags are that people come up with over time. So um, yeah, I also wrote down a few questions if you don't mind. So uh, one was, you talked about um, neutral words in Italian and um, yes. so my native language is German and we don't have a word like they in our language. And mm -hmm. we have some neo pronouns, but they're like so someone just, they sound like someone came up with them. So none of them really takes hold. Yes. So I was wondering how it is in Italian because it's also a gendered language. It's very, very similar. Um, and this is why uh, a lot of people have um, in the community have taken to uh, change the ending vowel with a U mm -hmm. instead, uh, instead of the regular O or A for masculine and feminine respectively. Um, however, a lot of people uh, feel uneasy with this change. Uh, they're worried about uh, grammar. Um, so we're still trying to find a way that makes everybody happy. Um, 
I do have my own opinion, <laughs> uh, if I may share it. Yeah. I think that uh, when it comes to someone's well-being, grammar should fall into second place. Um, but I also understand that language is made to be understood. And if we don't understand each other, there's no point in language. Um, so we need to find ways to evolve uh, our languages to make them more comfortable for, for everyone. I, I also mentioned the schwa uh, mm -hmm. symbol earlier, which is the upside down E. And I think that that actually comes from German. <laughs> oh, okay. It's, uh, if you pronounce it, it's supposed to be a sound like E. Uh, so an in between an O and an A. And again, a lot of Italian people are not super satisfied <laughs> with the, with this option because they're uh, uh, not used to making this this kind of sounds. Um, another way that you can um, have neutral language is use person as a su subject in the sentence. So person in Italian, persona, uh, it's still a feminine word. However, uh, as it, it's a general word, um, a lot of people feel that uh, being a general word, um, they are not specifically assigned a gender from the outside. So we're having a general conversation. This person wants a coffee. For example, questa persona vorrebbe un caffè. Right? And uh, it might be a little bit tricky at the beginning, uh, but it's definitely doable and still understanding. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of it is about getting used to it, just like society gets yes. more used to um, people of the same sex holding hands in public. It's a lot of just with language, too. It's uh, if you get used to it over time and language always changes. If we try to read something from 200 years ago, we might not understand so much. So it's, it's a natural <laughs> process, I guess. Um, okay, I, I have more questions, but I also want to be mindful of the time, so maybe we can circle back later again. Sorry, I, I like to talk a lot. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Perfect. I just have too many questions for all of you, but <laughs> let's, um, let's move over to Mindy's topic next and to San Francisco. I, I would like to start by saying that the subject is personal to me because I lived in San Francisco for many years and I absolutely adored it. So I decided to offer this as a topic. It's taught me a lot about the LGBTQIA plus community, thereby much more to learn. To deep, rich history subject and time constraints. My presentation today will only give you time constraints. My presentation today will only give you a glimpse of the history of the community in San Francisco. I'll encourage you at San Francisco to research and learn more as it is a fat tale of resilience, support, heartache, and love. So, although records indicate Native American tribes in the era were long practicing gender fluidity before. It was during the 1800s when San Francisco, in the mid 1800s, when San Francisco was in search of gold and ended up in San Francisco. 
eventually about 95% of the population there was male. Sorry, I lost my place. These men away from home and taboos felt free to experiment, taking on gender roles typically assigned to women. This included same-sex dancing and cross-dressing at social events. Many of the small population of women also took to cross-dressing for safety, as well as experimentation. Ultimately, the acceptance of this changed in the city, leading to the criminalization of perceived gender, gender transgressions to include cross-dressing. Although records, uh, like many other institutions in the late 1800s and early 1900s, if you outlaw something a large part of the population wants, they will find a way to do it anyway. So one of the city's first red light districts, the Barbary Coast, saw a re-emergence of the queer culture in bars and nightclubs, which often included cross-dressing. It was also during this time, World War I, that the US Armed Forces began to practice the blue discharge. This is when soldiers with undesirable characteristics, mostly gays and blacks, were dropped off in port cities. Thus began the influx of the gay men in San Francisco, many of who ultimately made the beautiful city their new The early 1960s saw the first only gay candidate in the USA to run for office in Polk Street, and the Tenderloin districts became a safe haven for the LGBTQ plus community and businesses. That is until the police raided a popular gay bar and about 100 people created a popular gay bar and, and prompted me to start the first gay business association called the, the first gay business association called the Tab Guild. In the mid 1960s, life on San Francisco becoming the capital of America. It was shortly thereafter that SIR was formed, or SIR, the Society for Individual Rights. SIR, SIR was an organization and soon became the largest gay in the USA. In the same year, the infamous Compton's Cafeteria Riot took place the first transgender riot in US history. The cafeteria was a popular place for the trans community to gather in the Tenderloin. After a night of police harassment, a trans woman who had had enough threw a cup of coffee in a policeman's face. After that, trans people were banned and the picketing began. On this event, the need for transgender first transsexual organization, the world's first was founded. The Sexual Freedom League, originally founded in New York, ultimately created roots in San Francisco. Nude demonstrations were held to remove the stigma from sexual activity. Legalizing abortion became a passionate cause within the organization, 
as well as addressing other laws around sexual freedom. The 1970s saw a dramatic support for LGBTQ plus rights in San Francisco, for LGBTQ plus rights in San Francisco, San Francisco Pride, was held at the beginning of the day. Twin Peaks Tavern became the first officially openly gay bar, removing its black windows, previously a requirement for all its similar establishments. The San Francisco Bisexual Center was founded, and the first rainbow striped LGBT and member of it, and the first rainbow striped LGBT in 1977. The first openly gay elected in California, first openly gay elected official in California, advisor. Local activists for BTQ plus rights implement that today. One year after his election, he and the city's mayor, George Moscone, were assassinated by Dan White. The former police officer was only sentenced to seven years in prison. This outraged the gay community. And as a result, a large violent protest called the White Knight Riots took place where gay citizens clashed with local police. Unfortunately, the AIDS epidemic was discovered in the 1980s. This greatly affected the gay community of San Francisco, ultimately taking more than 20,000 lives over the next 15 years. By this time, the Castro dis District had become one of America Castro Theater. It was there that a documentary by David Weissman on the AIDS crisis called We Were Here was first shown. At the start of the 90s, a worldwide conference was held in San Francisco to represent the bisexual community. The first official Bisexual Pride Day followed in the same year. After observation of racism within the gay community, Rodney Barnett took matters into his own hands and opened the first Black-owned gay bar in the city by buying the Eagle Creek Saloon, whose name he changed to the New Eagle Creek Saloon. Located in the Castro area, it soon became a popular destination. Establishment employed women and Zach DJs, along with additional employed women and Black DJs entertainment. The new Eagle Creek Saloon was all inclusive, happily serving and celebrating people of all races. Celebrating and celebrating people of the National AIDS Memorial World AIDS Day in 1994. The beginning of the new century saw the continuance and success of the fight for equality for the LGBTQ plus community. The first same-sex marriage licenses were issued to the founders of the Daughters of Belitis, the first lesbian civil and political rights organization in the USA. San, Francis San Franciscans Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon were the first same-sex couple to legally marry in the United States. A few years later, the city held the first San Francisco Trans March, later becoming one of the largest trans events in the world. 
a decade later, Compton's Transgender Cultural District in the Tenderloin became the first legally recognized transgender district in the USA. Around the same time, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors passed a law making it illegal for the city to do business with companies based in U.S. states that forbid civil rights protections for the LGBTQ plus people. Ain't there is still a supportive and deep history for the community in San Francisco. There are many things that you can see, such as the San Francisco LGBT Center, which is in the Castro. There's a museum, the GLBT Historical Society Museum, also in the Castro. There's the National AIDS Memorial Grove in uh, Golden Gate Park. There's the Harvey Milk installation at the airport. Um, that just was um, implemented in 2020, 2020 yes. I, I didn't live there at the time, but I was able to uh, visit San Francisco last year and fly into that terminal. And it's just stunning. It's a beautiful, beautiful tribute to Harvey Milk. There's the Human Rights Campaign Store, which is a store for the community that is in Harvey Milk's old building, the famous cat. Theater, which is and of course, um, open gay bar. So that is still there as well. So if you ever visit San Francisco, I encourage you to visit these places. Uh, and that is all. Happy Pride. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, yeah, so let me check the comments. Um, so one student says, um, it shows there has been so much progress made through the years, uh, thanks to all the activists in each generation. Yeah, and it's important to learn about that history too, especially since it's in many countries, not in the school books. So thank you for sharing that local history. Um, it seems like it, the sound cut off a few times um, mm -hmm. and the students said that, but also that the material was very interesting. So yeah, everyone feel free to check out the um, slides in the supplementary material section as well, please. Um, so yeah, my, my question kind of um, t links into what you said at the end about uh, places people can visit. Is there also like a, like a city tour where people can go and, and visit these places or is it kind of on your own you need to know where to go if, if you know about that oh maybe the time lag is a bit too big right now Oh no. Yeah, okay, maybe I we can circle have back zero to Zero doubt there, there is. I haven't seen the tour, but large items you can take. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, then let's um, go to the final topic. Um, Sinead, are you ready? All right, excellent. So um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here for this um, Pride Week symposium. It's an honor. Um, so to introduce myself, so my name is uh, Sinead. I am from Ireland. And today I will be talking about uh, the legalization of same-sex marriage in Ireland and talking about the road um, to equality that took place in Ireland. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, I'll just give you a bit of background to myself. So, as I mentioned, my name is uh, Sinead. My full name is Sinead Ryan, which is a very Irish name. <laughs> uh, 
It's a very common name in Ireland, but absolutely not common outside of it. <laughs> so don't worry if you have trouble with the spelling. Many people do. Um, so uh, just a bit of, uh, of my academic background. So I graduated from University College Cork in Ireland with a, a BCom in International Business Studies with Chinese Language Studies. And I actually lived in China for 10 years as well. Um, and I have been in Japan for almost two years now. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, and I've been an English teacher for over 10 years. Of course, the majority of that being having been in China. But um, yes, I am enjoying my uh, time in Japan very much. So thank you so much. All right. So let's get started. Okay. So um, first, I just want to give you um, a little look at the legalization journey that Ireland took on its way to get that um, to get same sex marriage legalized. So um, as you can see here, oh, first, um, homosexuality was only decriminalized in 1993, which, um, in my opinion, is extremely late. And um, in fact, Ireland was the last remaining member of the EEC, also known as the European Economic Community, to retain criminal penalties against homosexual activity. Um, it was a long journey in getting homosexuality decriminalized, started in the 1970s, and it, you know, um, um, the penultimate decision was made in 1993 and it went all the way from the Irish courts up to the uh, European Court of Human Rights. Um, so thankfully it was decriminalized then, um, a little bit late, but yeah, nonetheless. <clears throat> So next, um, so going on from there, the next kind of pivotal moment um, on the way to this legalization of same-sex marriage was the Civil Partnership Act, which uh, recognized same-sex unions, but not marriages. So the uh, relationship was seen on a sort of lower level compared to an official marriage. Um, so the driving force behind this Civil Partnership Act was actually the result of another court case um, um, sought by two by a lesbian couple seeking recognition of their Canadian marriage in Ireland. They were unfortunately unsuccessful, um, but thanks to their efforts, um, the Civil Partnership Act came into being, and on from that, um, it was also a driving one of the driving forces that led to the um, eventual legalization of same-sex marriage. So, um, yes. All right. So, and then finally, as you can see, um, the Marriage Act, as we know it today, was um, approved in 2015, and it was the first case where same-sex marriage was approved by a public vote, public referendum, and that momentous day was the 22nd of May in 2015. All right, so uh, thank you so much. Up next, so um, here are some notable people who played a big role in um, helping Ireland along its way to becoming a more progressive and inclusive nation. So first up, we have here Senator um, David Norris. So he was um, he was a member of the um, Irish government. He was actually the first openly gay uh, openly gay. Uh, person to be elected to public office in Ireland. So that was a huge um, milestone in Ireland's um, pursuit of equality. And he is actually an expert on James Joyce, and he pursued the case to decriminalize homosexual activity all the way up to the European Court of Human Rights. So he is to thank for that um, momentous uh, uh, sort of step. <laughs> All right. And next, we have these two wonderful women here, Catherine Zapone and Anne Louise Gilligan. And as I mentioned, um, in regards to the Civil Partnership Act, so it was actually because of their court case. So their court case was the one that was one of the driving forces that led to the establishment of this act. Um, so they sought to 
um, seek recognition for their Canadian marriage were unfortunately unsuccessful at that time. But um, when the Same Sex Marriage Act came into being in 2015, they were able to renew their vows and were officially recognized as married by the Irish government. So they eventually found success, which is fantastic. Um, so actually, um, the lady on the left side here, Catherine Sapone, so she actually became the first openly lesbian member of the Irish cabinet in 2016. And she also lended her voice to repeal the eighth uh, movement in 2018. And as, as you know, they campaigned fiercely for years for marriage equality and eventually their um, efforts were realized. So that is amazing. Uh, next up, uh, you might recognize this man. His name is Leo Varadkar. So he has been the Irish Taoiseach. So Taoiseach in Ireland is the equivalent of the Prime Minister. So he was the Irish Prime Minister. And after the Same Sex Marriage Act was passed, he came out as a gay man. And he actually was... Uh, he experienced a lot of firsts um, as an Irish uh, political member. So he became, of course, the first Taoiseach from an ethnic minority, um, as well as the world's, the world's fifth, but Irish's first, openly gay head of government. So that it was amazing. And um, yeah, so he was elected in 2017. So that was a huge... A milestone because Ireland, um, as some of you may know, was traditionally an extremely Catholic country. So, you know, a lot of social restriction was present um, in a lot of Ire Ireland's history. Um, but actually, it, in part, thanks to their membership of the European Union, um, you know, with more economic freedom um, came more social freedom. So this was also um, one of the driving forces behind, you know, all of these uh, wonderful events. And finally, as you can see down the bottom, we have this woman, um, Nell McCafferty. So she is actually a journalist and she was a founding member of the Irish Women's Liberation Movement. <clears throat> and uh, she writes a lot on women's rights and um, the status of women in Irish society. And in fact, in 1971, she traveled to Belfast with other members of the Irish Women's Liberation Movement um, to um, protest the prohibition of and importation and sale of contraceptives in the Republic of Ireland. So she was a very um, important person as well. All right. Next, thank you so much. Next, we have um, some examples here of the social change or some of the reasons for it. So um, here, um, the first picture you can see, um, there are two men making out, basically. I don't need to explain that, I guess. But um, it was very significant because this was the first ever um, gay kiss aired on Irish television. And it was actually on an Irish language soap opera. So, you know, being a traditionally extremely conservative country um, and having a lot of, um, you know, religious influence, this would have been absolutely unheard of in the decades prior. So this was a huge um, step forward in um, the on the road to equality. So I thought I would like I'd like to point that out because I thought it was wonderful. And uh, one of the reasons, so as I mentioned, thanks to Ireland's growing economy um, you know, in being becoming a member of the European Union and, of course, their more globalist outreach, more young people remained in Ireland. So if you know a little bit about Irish history, you will know that many people emigrated um, in the past. Uh, so young people sought opportunities elsewhere. But now due to Ireland's growing economy, many young people remained. And of course, due to not only that um, fact, but also the fact that the economy was growing, people sought more freedoms because they had more economic freedom, which led to social freedom. Okay. 
Next up. So um, this is my favorite slide because it highlights the um, milestone that was achieved, which is, of course, that Ireland finally legalized same-sex marriage. So as you can see here, I love this picture because on the left side, it has the English yes, and on the right, it has the Irish language um, translation. So the Irish for yes is ta. So I really like that, you know, it retains some cultural uh, nuance there. So I'll just uh, give you a little bit of um, uh, extra information about the act itself. So Ireland became the first ever country to legalize gay marriage by popular vote. And this happened on the 26th or 22nd, my apologies, of May in 2015. And the, you know, the, um, the results um, were substantial um, in favor of yes. So as you can see, the yes vote was given 62% and no only 38%. So the Irish people really, um, you know, came forward and um, expressed how they, or expressed what direction they wanted the country to go in. So it was fantastic to see such a wide majority there. And also, so the pro-reform vote um, was also energized by an 11th hour movement and hashtag home to vote, which was a social media campaign that really encouraged Irish expatriates, because there are a lot of them, um, to return home to Ireland and vote. In fact, my best friend, Kieran, was living in Amsterdam at the time, and as a result of this campaign, he traveled back, he took time off work, and he traveled back and put in his vote for this very important um, referendum. And uh, as a result of the uh, success and the yes vote in the referendum, um, the rainbow colors of the international gay movement lit up the 18th century cobbled courtyard of Dublin Castle, and over 2,000 people came there to celebrate. So that must have been absolutely fantastic. Unfortunately, at that time, I was living in China, so I could only watch it from my television, but I was very happy nonetheless, of course. Now, interestingly enough, if you look to the right here, you will see um, I have here equality milestone continued. So as you know, Ireland is, uh, so Ireland is divided into two uh, countries. So of course the South is the Republic of Ireland an independent nation. The North is Northern Ireland and it is still a part of the UK. However, Northern Ireland has its own parliament. So even though um, the other countries in the UK, England, Scotland, and Wales had already legalized same-sex marriage, same-sex marriage was not legalized in Northern Ireland until 2020, which was quite late. But um, now, thankfully, the whole um, country has legalized it. All right. Um, here are some references and further reading, so you can check these out if you're interested in the supplementary materials. Um, and, you know, if you would like to learn more and continue our conversation, my Twitter handle is Sinead R. Um, I'll be on standby after this event. And if you would like to take my lessons, um, I've trial options for all of my lessons and I can ta tailor them to your specific needs. So if you are interested, I would love for you to get in touch um, and also just continue chatting would be fantastic as well. So that's all for me. Thank you so much for listening um, to my speech. And just at the bottom there is a cladder ring. It's a traditional Irish ring and people often use it uh, to symbolize friendships, engagements or marriages. And I actually created this ring uh, with an AI tool and it came out really beautifully and I might actually get one made if possible. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing this great history with us. Oh, okay, let me see what we have in the chat. Um, so two students here were very surprised that uh, homosexuality was still illegal until the 1990s. Um, yeah, me included, I, was, I also <laughs> didn't know about that. 
Yeah, it's a it's an unfortunate kind of dark side to Irish history, you know, because, you know, Irish is an extremely progressive and liberal country nowadays, but it wasn't very long ago when it was the complete opposite, very conservative, very religious. So it's uh, the change, the social changes have been very rapid. So it's um, mm -hmm. I've been very happy to see it progress. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, and it's it's easy to see in one's lifetime um, that way, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so wait, let me just the the chat always keeps jumping, and then I oh. lose where I am. Okay, I found it again. <laughs> so um, yeah, another student says they didn't know um, about the prime ministers coming out, and that it's very beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely, um, and it's it's always even more difficult for people who are in the spotlight, if it's politicians or sports people or whoever. And, um, but it, it obviously means a lot also. Um, exactly. And then someone asks um, if someone had a civil partnership, once same sex marriage existed, could they just change it over? Or do you know how that worked? So from my understanding, I think you would just um, so a civil partnership would be a different thing under the law. So you would have to get married as you normally would. Yes. So you would just go through the marriage protocol. That's what I understand, but I'm actually not too sure. So I will need to follow that up, but I'm pretty sure you would just, okay. um, yeah, go through the marriage um, protocol or, yeah. Yeah. as normal <laughs> makes sense and yeah. i guess everyone who then got married probably had no problem celebrating a second time so <laughs> exactly <laughs> that was probably <laughs> right everyone wants to do that anyway so that's great <laughs> double the party <laughs> exactly um yeah and then uh, another student uh, just sent thank you points and said happy pride so definitely thank you for that thank you <laughs> um it, something I just also wondered about, if you know about that, since it's still recent history, but um, so the uh, referendum had like 63 positive votes. Um, do you know how perception has changed since then? Because I feel my, my impression would be if you actually see that society doesn't fall apart after same sex marriage exists in your country, it might even go up more. Or do you know anything about that? Mm, so actually, I did a little bit of research and it's very interesting. So initially, after the Same Sex Marriage Act came into being, the amount of um, gay marriages and gay unions shot up. But then after a time, it mm -hmm. kind of leveled off. So mm -hmm. I, I don't really know if there's been any dramatic kind of um, increase, but certainly certainly it's easier for people but yeah in in terms yeah. of what you said i'm actually not sure exactly but it seems that it's kind of uh mm -hmm. leveled off yeah i see or it just becomes normal which is definitely not a bad thing so. yeah that's a better way to put it yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> <laughs> okay um, so you already told us a little bit of your lessons on Cafe Talk, but I also want to give a friend and Minnie the chance to quickly mention uh, what you're teaching. So um, Fran, do you want to go first and just talk a little bit about your lessons? Oh, sure. Thank you so much. So uh, on Cafe Talk, I mainly um, have lessons for uh, conversation practice, both for Italian and English, as it's my which um, my uh, second focus is art. Um, I like to pair uh, art with language learning. I use uh, bullet journaling a lot. So creating small illustrations that can um, help visualize the words that we are trying to learn. And uh, in my experience, and in my opinion, makes uh, language learning a little bit more interesting and fun. <laughs> I also have um, standard, let's say, uh, more traditional watercolor lessons. If uh, anyone is interested, um, it takes, uh, these are uh, longer lessons as uh, the media takes a long time uh, to dry, uh, but I make sure to have regular breaks and uh, we can engage in any kind of conversation as you wish. In any language as per your choice. Thank you. Okay, great. That's great. So someone can practice a bit of Italian and also learn arts with you or English and learn arts. That's wonderful. That's right. 
Okay, so I, Mindy, I hope your internet connection is stable right now. Would you like to tell us a bit about your lessons? I hope. Well, I'm, I'm sorry about before I can be heard. Can I hear me okay? Seems okay right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> great. Uh, I do have a lot of uh, discussion classes of various lengths. Uh, I also have um, cooking classes. Uh, when I lived in San Francisco, I went to culinary school. So uh, one of my favorite things is to combine um, talking about food in English, right? Because it likes food. So um, I have lessons about order in restaurants and um, all of my order in restaurants and um, all my lessons very custom classes as well. And uh, without for coupons, because I do give coupons so you can uh, see if we see if we vibe for free. Um, so yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, yeah, um, I'm just checking the chat again. We have another message, just uh, thank you for sharing. It's interesting. So, yes, thank you for commenting and thank you for watching. I was able to learn a lot as well. So thank you all for sharing um, your different presentations with us. Um, yeah, and please feel free out uh, to check uh, the tutors' profiles, um, check them out and take a look at their lessons. And um, thank you all again for joining today and happy Pride and goodbye. Happy Pride. Bye. Happy Pride. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.